you're listening to Life in the A-Zone podcast. I'm Peggy Sweeney McDonald, and these are my stories of moving back to my hometown in Louisiana after 36 years to live with my father and mother when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. These lessons of love, laughter, life, and loss are gifts of living in the A-Zone, and I'm honored to share them with you. If this is your first time here, begin the journey with Episode 1 and go forward. Thank you for joining me today. I'm standing in the kitchen making a salad for dinner when I hear my dad's van pull into the driveway. They are home from their trip to Memphis, Tennessee and Rolla, Missouri. I open the back door and my dad walks in furious and shaking. I've had it. I'm done he says as he walks to the bathroom and shuts the door. Mom strolls in the door, and I hug her. Peggy, your dad is crazy. I'm really worried about him. He's been driving around in a circle for hours. And she heads to her bedroom and shuts the door. Dad, what happened? I ask when he comes out of the bathroom. Never again. For the last five hours, she has been screaming at me that I was going the wrong way. You missed our stop, she kept saying. I told her I was going to call you or one of the other girls, and y'all would tell her that I know where I am going, but she grabbed my phone. He pours himself a whiskey on ice, takes a big gulp, and sits at the kitchen table. His face is red, and he seems out of breath. I have never seen my dad like this. His blood pressure must be through the roof. My dad, our protector and the king of the family, is always in control, and now he is crumbling right before my eyes. I'm so sorry, Dad. I'm not sure if she threw my phone away when we stopped for gas and she went to the bathroom. Let me go check her purse. I walk in the bedroom, and Mom is pulling her clothes out of the suitcase and just tossing them on the big armchair next to her side of the bed. Mom, do you have Dad's cell phone? No, I don't have it, she says defiantly as I dig through her purse, not finding it. Jimmy arrives home and goes outside to help Dad search through the car looking for the lost cell phone. They have all the car rugs pulled out and tossed on the ground. Dad, do you have the Find My Phone app? I ask him. I think Shannon set it up for me, but I'm not sure. I call Shannon and tell her what's happening. Let me try to find it on my laptop. I'll call you back, she says. Dad and Jimmy are now digging through the glove compartment and the side door pockets. Dad is livid and his head is about to explode. This is why you shouldn't ever take an Alzheimer's patient on a road trip. Nothing good can come of it, Jimmy says to me, shaking his head. The house phone rings, and I see it's Shannon on the caller ID, so I grab it quickly before Mom answers it in her bedroom. Too late. Hello, Mom says from the bedroom phone. Dad comes in the door, looking defeated. I'm on the Find My Phone app, and the phone is there in the house. It should be beeping, Shannon says. I didn't take his phone, Mom says from the bedroom, and hangs up. Jimmy goes to the car to see if he hears the phone beep. Dad and I walk back to the bedroom. Mom is now laying in bed reading a magazine. We hear a soft beep in the room. Dad and I look at each other with relief. I think it's coming from the dresser. I get on my hands and knees and look under the bed and under the dresser. Dad looks in the closet. I realize the beep is coming from Mom's dresser drawers. I open her three top jewelry drawers one by one. No luck. Then I open her middle drawer, her underwear drawer. I move her undies around and find the phone at the bottom of the drawer. Here it is, Dad, and I hand it to him. He sighs and shakes his head before turning to Mom. Sherry, you had it the whole time. How could you do something so mean? You hid my phone from me? Dad, stop. I know him arguing with her will just make things worse. I've learned the hard way. I didn't have your phone. I don't know how it got there. Stop blaming me for everything, she screams. It's okay, Mom. It's okay. We found it. That's all that matters, Mom. It's okay. 
dad walks out with his phone and I follow him. I still have the house phone in my hand. Dad goes straight to his chair in the living room, grabs his rocks glass and finishes the rest of his whiskey. I hear the bedroom door slam. I realize Shannon has been on the phone the entire time and heard the whole exchange. We found it. I'll call you back. I know. Please do, she says, and hangs up. Jimmy and I sit with Dad, and he tells us about the road trip from hell. For the last few months, my mom had been telling my dad she wanted to go visit one of her old childhood best friends, Barbara, who lives in Missouri. My niece Peyton was participating in the summer intern program at St. Jude in Memphis, so they drove to Memphis on Thursday, had a lovely dinner with Peyton, and spent the night in a hotel. The next day they drove to Rolla, Missouri for a weekend visit with Barbara and her husband Gary. Mom was thrilled to see Peyton and to spend time with her friend Barbara. The visit was wonderful, but the drive home on Monday was not. Dad had planned to stop in Memphis for a sightseeing trip at Graceland, check into a hotel to spend the night, and watch the LSU baseball game on TV that evening. Mom was sound asleep when they arrived in Memphis, so he just decided to keep driving to Baton Rouge. Then she woke up right past Memphis, and everything went to pieces. Where are you going? You missed our exit, she said. For the next five hours, she berated him, threatened to jump out the car, and to throw her Diet Coke at him. But the worst moment was when they stopped for gas. There was a policeman sitting in a police car. She threatened to go tell him that Dad was kidnapping her. Dad told Mom that if she did that, they would put her in the mental ward of a hospital and she would have to stay there for days for observation. I'm so sorry, Dad. I guess I should have gone on the trip with you. I call Shannon and fill her in. She's putting them in danger and anyone else on the road. It may be time to put her in memory care, Shannon tells me. Shannon has always been the voice of reason in our family. I know. I'm worried about Dad. I've never seen him this rattled. When I get off the phone, I tell Dad what Shannon said, and he shakes his head as if he gets it. But I can see he's not ready for this big decision. I check on Mom, and the bedroom door is locked. I reach for the door key over the door jam and open it. Mom, are you hungry? I made a big green salad, and we have Calvin's chicken salad. Okay, I'm coming. She joins me in the kitchen, and I hand her napkins and silverware. She spends five minutes trying to set the table. The silverware is set in a crazy pattern, but does it really matter? <laughs> Dad tells me he isn't hungry. Jimmy joins us, and as we eat, I ask Mom about her visit with Aunt Barbara. Who? she asks. Your friend Barbara and Gary. Did you have fun at their house in Missouri? We didn't see them. Yes, Mom, you went to see Peyton and Aunt Barbara. We saw Peyton. She was so happy. She loves working there. I let it go. I tell Dad later that she didn't remember seeing Barbara. He looks downfallen. That's ridiculous. I'll show her the pictures tomorrow. The next morning, I find Mom and Dad in the living room sitting on the old green sofa, and he is showing her pictures of their visit with Barbara on his cell phone, trying to convince her that they went to visit her. That was years ago, she said. No, that was this past weekend. You don't remember, Sherry? No, you don't remember. Why are you doing this to me? She says and walks out of the room. Dad and I look at each other, not saying a word. It's so depressing. Life in the A zone is cruel. My strong dad is depleted and exhausted. When will we learn not to argue or reason with her? Life in the A zone is a lost cause. I drink my coffee, then go looking for mom. She is crying in her bedroom. Mom, are you okay? I just want to die, she says. Oh, Mom, please don't say that. We stand hugging and crying together. I don't know what to say or what to do. I understand. Part of me wants to die, too. 
This is too freaking hard. We can't do this. We don't want to do this. I don't know how to do this. Days go by, weeks go by, and I forget about the trip from hell. When my friend Catherine offers me her theater tickets to see the Broadway musical Waitress at the Sanger Theater in New Orleans the next Sunday, I jump at the opportunity. I am starving for live theater, my favorite thing to do, and it's been way too long. Mom also loves theater. We both love musicals. I've heard great things about Waitress, so I decided to take her for a wonderful mother-daughter day trip to New Orleans. I can't wait to tell her. I go into planning mode. We can have brunch before going to see the play. New Orleans offers so many great brunch options. I will look for a restaurant near the theater so we can park once and then walk to the theater. Mom, do you want to go see Waitress, the musical at the Sanger? Catherine gave me her tickets, I asked her at dinner that night. Yes, that sounds fun, she says. That was sweet of Catherine. Your mother will love going to see the play. Where will you park? Dad asks. I think we should park at the Ritz-Carlton and have brunch in their restaurant, then walk to the theater. It's only two blocks away. That sounds like a great plan. I will give you some cash for brunch and parking. Thank you for asking your mother, Peggy. It will be a treat for her, Dad says. I know he's grateful for a day to himself. It will be a treat for me too, Dad. I really mean it. I believe it. I want a beautiful mother-daughter day with my mom. In 1987, I moved to New York City with $1,500 in my bank account and big dreams of making it as an actress. My mother was the first one to come visit me in the little one-bedroom sublet apartment I had in Chelsea. I was working as a temp in different offices each week and barely making enough money for rent, food, acting classes, and subways. I was lucky at that time to have seen one off-Broadway play as a guest of an LSU theater buddy who worked as the artistic director. My mother scheduled her trip just five weeks after I had moved. I think she wanted to check on me. I wouldn't admit it, but I was lonely, and life in New York wasn't as glamorous as I had imagined. With Mom there, I knew I would finally be able to enjoy New York because she would spoil me. I planned our itinerary and didn't accept any work for that week. I was going to play with my mom in my new city, even if I would have to eat scrambled eggs and peanut butter sandwiches for a week after she left. Mom and I went to see three Broadway plays, including Dreamgirls and the newly opened Steel Magnolias play, where we laughed and cried, then by chance met the Louisiana playwright Robert Harling in the lobby. It was exciting. We dined at Sardi's, where I was able to get an actor's discount with my Screen Actors Guild card. We walked down Fifth Avenue shopping, sat people watching on a park bench in Washington Square, got lost in the village, and ate at Carmela's, a wonderful little Italian restaurant. They didn't serve alcohol at the restaurant, and we didn't know to pick up a bottle of wine beforehand. But my mom, who never met a stranger, started talking to the young couple sitting next to us, and soon they were sharing their wine with us and became our best friends for the night. After our fabulous Italian dinner, we went to a piano bar down the street where Broadway actors sang show tunes. It was glorious, glamorous, and intoxicating. Mom and I sat eating a New York hot dog on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum before spending hours wandering the halls of the museum, where we fell in love with the Impressionist, especially the Degas ballerinas. On Sunday morning, we got dressed up and attended Mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral, then took a cab to Tavern on the Green for a delicious brunch in the beautiful Crystal Room, filled with chandeliers and wonderful colors, then finally went to the ballet at Lincoln Center. We strolled through Central Park and stopped for a drink at the Plaza Hotel Oak Room Bar before heading home. It was a magical mother-daughter week. This was the New York I dreamed of. I wasn't pinching pennies. I was living the life. 
My mom treated me like a princess. The day she left, we went out for breakfast at a diner on the corner. Then she insisted on taking me to Gerstiti's grocery store to stock my refrigerator. We stood hugging outside my building, waiting for the car service to take her to LaGuardia Airport. As the car pulled up, we reluctantly separated, and she handed me an envelope with her leftover subway tokens and cash. You take this, Peggy. You need this more than me. I stood watching her drive away, waving at me from the back window. Once back in my apartment, I felt empty and melancholy. I sat on the sofa crying and thought, Why am I here? This city is so big and overwhelming me. I felt paralyzed with fear, but my dreams were bigger. I kept moving forward. I think of those days in New York as I drive the 80 miles to downtown New Orleans, listening to the 50 station on Sirius Radio. Mom is no longer singing along to the songs. She isn't talking to me. She isn't telling me her stories anymore. I try to talk to her and she barely replies. I remember how annoyed we would get when she told us the same stories over and over again a few years ago. What were we thinking? I would give anything for one of her stories right now. The silence is suffocating, uncomfortable. I try to think of things to say to her, but my mind goes blank. She just stares out of the window. This is going to be a long day. Peggy, how much longer? About 30 more minutes, Mom. Where are we going? To see the Broadway play Waitress, it's going to be wonderful, Mom. Where's Dad? He's at home. We'll see him after the play. What play? We pull into the garage at the Ritz-Carlton and valet park the car. The restaurant is beautiful. The hostess shows us to our table and Mom looks around the room. This is pretty, she says. Do you want a mimosa, Mom? Sure. Do you want to split French toast and an omelet? Okay. I try to make small talk. Our food comes and we eat in silence. The excitement of the day is gone. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. I look at my watch. The play isn't for another hour. Damn. I ask our waitress to take our picture. We smile our Sweeney smiles, but there's nothing behind them today. No joy. No happiness. We are sitting in this beautiful restaurant, eating a delicious meal, but I can barely taste the food, and I'm not enjoying the company. I pull out my phone, text Dad, and send him the picture. We are having brunch, I text. All is good. I lie. Have fun, he texts back. Yes, a barrel of laughter. <laughs> a ton of fun, I think. By the time we pay the bill and stop at the bathroom, it's time to walk down the street to the Sanger Theater. I see lines of people waiting outside the theater, slowly making their way through the doors. What are we doing here? Mom asks. We're going to see a play, Mom. It's going to be great. Your tickets are up the stairs to the right in the upper balcony, the usher tells me. Is there an elevator, I ask? I haven't been here since I was a kid. No elevators. Sorry. Mom and I make our way up a flight of stairs. She isn't happy and is seriously pissed off once I tell her we have one more flight of stairs to go. We find our seats. We watch the crowds find their seats and stare at the stage while the orchestra warms up. Look at the set, Mom. It's a diner. That's cute. She looks through the program but doesn't read it. I don't think Mom reads anymore. My mom loved to read, and I think she owns every Danielle Steele book ever published. These days, she flips through magazines and barely looks at the newspaper. She used to work the crossword puzzle every morning. Those days are over. Scratch reading and crossword puzzles off her list. Her list gets smaller and smaller. I remember the to-do list she used to make on a yellow legal pad with recipes, shopping lists, people to call, letters to write. 
I find those yellow pads around the house now, memories of what used to be. I have never been so grateful for a Broadway show to begin. Sing, please sing. Dance, please dance. I'm waiting for the magic of theater to transform me and take me away from my reality for a few hours. It doesn't happen. Mom's bored and restless. She keeps fidgeting and sighing and staring at me. I pretend to be enjoying the play. I want to enjoy the play. It is great. The songs are beautiful and wonderful. The script is engaging, but I am not transformed. I am not taken away. Sadly, my Broadway fix no longer works. Is it almost over? She says loudly. Shh, I tell her, shaking my head. The couple sitting in front of us gives us a dirty look. This is painful. This is not fun. This is not magical. This sucks. It's intermission and I need to go to the bathroom. She thinks we are leaving. She thinks the play is over. No, Mom, it's intermission, I tell her, and I'm determined to see the rest of the play. We walk down the long flight of stairs and find the bathroom. For the first time in my life, I am grateful for a long line to the toilet. It will fill the time. She's now pissed off at me that we're not leaving. We make our way back to the seats. She's glaring at me when the second act begins. She stands up after 15 minutes. I'm leaving, she says. Oh, Mom. Okay, let's go. Never again. What was I thinking? I'm an idiot. What did I expect? Seriously, you think you can take your mother with Alzheimer's to the theater? You think you can have a nice mother-daughter day? Are you out of your mind? Yes, I'm out of my mind. I'm losing it. I'm losing it big time. I'm nuts. We finally get our car from the valet, and I pull out of the parking garage and head home. Please, Mom, take a nap, I think to myself. But no, the trip from hell begins. The unending questions begin. Where are you going, Peggy? We are going home, Mom. No, you're going the wrong way. No, Mom, this is the right way. Get off here, she tells me over and over again. Get off here. Her anxiety rises by the moment. I'm scared she's going to jump out of the car. Mom, we are going to Baton Rouge. We are almost there. This is Sorrento. This is Gonzales. This is Prairieville. And finally, here's Highland Road exit, Mom. We will be home in 10 minutes. How was the play, Dad asks as we walk in the house. I just shake my head. Mom, furious with me, goes straight to her room and closes the door. How was the play? Jimmy asks, coming into the kitchen. I take the waitress program out of my purse and toss it dramatically into the garbage can. It sucked. Never again. And I turn and walk upstairs, holding back tears. I change out of my mother-daughter day dress and throw on some I-don't-give-a-crap sweats. Jimmy walks into the bedroom. Are you okay? he asks. I can't even reply. The lump in my throat is strangling me. I just look at him and I, I start to sob. He hugs me and lets me cry. Breathe, just breathe, Peggy, he says, as my body shakes uncontrollably. Let's go for a walk, he says. We walk out to the lake, sit on the park bench, and I tell him about the day. All I wanted was a wonderful day with my mother. Is that too much to ask? Is it? even possible anymore? I don't know, Peg. I don't know. There's a song in Waitress called She Used to Be Mine, written by Sarah Bareilles. It's beautiful, soulful, and the lyrics will stay with me forever, I tell Jimmy. The waitress, Jenna, sings, She is gone, but she used to be mine. I feel like that about my mother, and I'm sure she feels like this about herself. I no longer recognize my mother, but now I no longer recognize me. We sit and watch the sun go down and then walk back to the house in silence. We find my mother and father in the living room watching TV. Where have you been all day? Mom asks me. I realize she doesn't remember we went to New Orleans. She doesn't remember the brunch and she doesn't remember the play. 
She doesn't remember she was mad at me. The beautiful mother-daughter day I had planned for us doesn't exist in her mind. It's hard enough to handle a regular day, but now I realize it's difficult to handle the special days too. Just like my parents' trip to Missouri, our mother and daughter trip to New Orleans was a trip to nowhere. Mom has forgotten and Dad and I are left with emotional hangovers full of disappointment and despair. A sadness weighs in our heart like boulders of grief. Alzheimer's is the great awakener. We stumble and we fall. It forces us to face our weaknesses, then dig deep for courage to keep moving forward. Dad and I are grasping at straws that crumble in our hands. How many more straws will we grasp? How many more times will we take a trip to nowhere? Thank you for joining me for Life in the A-Zone. Look for new episodes each Wednesday. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and follow on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To join my mailing list, go to lifeinthea-zone.com and check out my best-selling book, Meanwhile, back at Cafe Dumont, Life Stories About Food, at Amazon and Barnes & Noble.